Marty, tell me when you first came to Hollywood to go to work and why. I came as a director uh, after I had done Edge of the City. 1957? 1957. And Fox, I made the film for Metro and uh, they didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And when my agent, who was then MCA, said, you don't have to like it, it's a terrific movie. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the notices it's gotten. And they said, it's not our kind of picture. And Fox offered me a job. I was broke. I was in debt. I hadn't, I hadn't worked for <clears throat> from 51 to 57. And uh, I was happy to, to get a job in Hollywood. And uh, I came out here. And I immediately went into a long session of meetings with uh, Scorus, who said I was being attacked and I would have to go before the committee, and he went on and on and on about that. And I said, I'm not going to do any of that. I have nothing to hide. I've done nothing I'm ashamed of. And uh, I had worked there for three days, pay me for the three days, and I'll go home. He said, come to New York. I went back. Jay Cat was handling me at that time for MCA, and I went back and I went nine or ten days with scores in which, you know, he waved the flag and told me what a great country this was. He'd come here a poor boy and he'd sold popcorn and become a multimillionaire, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, oh, that's fine and well, and I don't bother anybody in my feeling for my country, but I'm not going to do anything that I don't want to do, that I think is shameful. Suddenly, for no reason that I could discern, he said, okay, you're a good boy. You come to Hollywood, you make good pictures for 20th Century Fox. That was it. I came back. I did a little picture that he jumped all over me about called No Down Payment, which was about suburbia. Mm -hmm. And then I did The Long Hot Summer, which was a commercial hit, written by The Ravages. And uh, then it was, you know, clear sailing. I was under contract and uh, at Fox, and I came out here. I wanted to work. So you've been out here since 1958, then? Yes, I have. Um, you were an actor, and you were also a Broadway director, right? And also a TV director, and yes. you're pretty well known. Yes. Why, why did it take you so long to get to Hollywood? At that time, I don't think they were hiring anybody from TV. And the two plays I did in New York were sort of success to Steams. They did not, they were not big successful plays. And uh, also I was blacklisted. So in those years when you know, some far-sighted guy, executive out here might have hired me at a cheap price, I was not hired. How did you know you were blacklisted? Well, I was working at CBS. And I got a call one day from a very nice guy called Donald Davis. He was the son of the player, I know him, Davis. And uh, he called me and asked me to have a meeting with him. And I went up to see him. He was on the 14th floor, I think, of old CBS on 55th Street, 2nd mm Avenue, -hmm. and 6th Avenue, Madison. And he said, I don't understand it, Marty, but you've not been renewed. Well, of course, I understood what was going on. My antenna were out. I said, well, this is it. He said, oh, Bonnie, come on. Not in this country. I said, okay, now, you'll see. That's how I found out. I was not renewed at CBS. And uh, I went home, and I told my wife, and I said, I mean, this is it. And I'm going to have to find a way of making a living. And Dell went out and got a job selling space for the Red Book mm -hmm. in New York, telephone book. And then I was hired finally to act in the show that Dan Petrie directed, mm -hmm. and produced by a guy who I helped a lot in the earlier days of TV. And two days into the show, I saw the executives come to Dan Petrie and start to chew his ear off. And I said, what's the problem, Dan? He said, they don't think you're right for the part. He was a truck driver, 35-year-old Italian truck driver. And so I told Dan what it was was a kid at that point just out of Chicago. He said, what are you talking about? Well, the show was taken off the air. It never appeared. And they put in some old kinescope. 
So that, uh, and then after that, you didn't work for six years. That's right. And I started to teach acting. I had a professional class. And I didn't really work again until uh, I was hired by Clifford Odets to be in the Flowering Peach, which I played small part, the eldest son, Chef. I went on to help him because he needed time off to rewrite the play after we opened it in Baltimore. And I directed the play for about through the Boston Open. That's about 1956. I'm not sure of the dates, but it must be about that time. Yeah. Um, would, it be, would it be fair to say that a common thread in your film is, is, is humanism? Yes, I think, that's, I think that's what I'm about. I mean, I'm really interested in the human condition. Is there a connection um, in your mind between your training as an actor and your interest in humanism? I think so, because as an actor, you look for those elements anyway in, your, in, your, in whatever part you play. You look for to complicate it as much as you can. And uh, I think there's something very akin uh, out of my acting training and uh, whatever abilities I have as an actor to uh, the kind of films I make. Conversely, is there some, you know, it seems to me that people who grew up in, in the atmosphere of the group theater and in the shadow of Broadway and even just coming off the streets as immigrants um, and, and made movies, that they were closer to people. Is there something uh, that in the Hollywood of today, in terms of people who grew up watching TV and video and in their living rooms, that, that keeps them away from humanism? I think so. I think so. I mean, the comic strip is. You know, apparently the art form of that generation. And now I hear, the last thing I heard on the radio was that the new generation is rejecting that for computers and listening to music and working at home and isolating themselves. So the, the new corporate executives are having to find a different kind of drone, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, humanism, I, except in the very gifted of the young. You were, were, once you're gifted, it's going to appear in your work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter what generation you came from. But as a generational thing, my generation was totally committed to that. How, how did growing up in the 30s affect your view ultimately towards making movies? Well, obviously, it affected it a great deal. It was a, a great liberal surge in, in the country, emotionally. Uh, politically, and I was part of it. And all the gifted people and all the excitement that I knew around the theater were people in, in that sector of our intellectual thought. Uh, and uh, I was lucky enough. I was working with an off-roadway group called the Theater of Action. And I met Kazan then. I was lucky enough to get around the group theater which are probably the single greatest group of American theater intellectuals that ever existed in, together in a cohesive unit. And so that is obviously part of my heritage. And when I began to look for material, I began to look in that area, in that mold, naturally. And that's where I, I feel most comfortable, where I feel, uh, and now I feel most needed because the times being so different today uh, a liberal who's really working and trying to work in the mainstream is a very rare item. That is, if he, then probably a lot of liberals who are working in the mainstream, but who don't make pictures about what what they believe. They make other kinds of pictures. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not my bag. Delineate for me that kind of material. Well, just. The two overtly political films that I've made, The Front and uh, The Mind of Wives, also Norm Array, also all the films I've made about blacks, implicit in uh, all those films is a very strong and deep feeling for the, uh, for the minorities, for the disenfranchised. Certainly the blacks in this country have been disenfranchised for most of their lives. I'll never forget, you know, I never didn't intend to cast Sicily in Sounder. 
and I can't, I asked, I asked another actress to play. She turned me down. And uh, when Sis came to me, I said to her, Sis, you're a high fashion model. I mean, you're a great beauty. I need a, a working class peasant woman. And she said, Marty, there are no blacks in this country more than one generation removed from that experience. And that sold me right then, because I realized the truth of that. And I said, OK, that's it. You got the part. And I, yeah, I was very happy, because obviously she was terrific. That what? reminded me of, of what I was trying to say. And the fact that no amount of uh, seeming uh, sophistication or uh, movement into another class, uh, an upper middle class or an intellectual class, would remove the genuine problem that always existed, that every black really knew about it all the time. That scar tissue was there and deep. I've had occasion in my career to fight that because I haven't agreed with them all the time. But I'm very aware of it, very sympathetic toward it, and feel that it is one of the most grievous errors that we've made in, in my time in this country. Do you remember an experience that brought you to that thinking, or was it just the general climate of the 30s? Well, the general climate of the 30s, plus my own intrinsic feelings about the disenfranchised, be they blacks, Mexicans, Jews, working people. Those, those are the people, really, that I'm most interested in. We were talking about Alvin doing streamers. Norman Jewison did Soldier's Story. Uh, why did so many um, white directors, there are so few black directors, so um, well, not tight. It's very tough for black to get a job directing. Yeah. You know, and uh, so that. Uh, why did so, so few white directors make movies about black people? I have no idea. What are the inherent problems when you start to do it being white? Well, that you're not black so that uh, you're not going to be as close to the material as you really would like to be. Because there's no way anybody can understand what being black is unless you're black. Some of us, you know, make a pretty good facsimile thereof. And I hope I'm one of those, but uh, I'm very aware uh, that blacks don't really get a shot. I had a lot of arguments with some of my black friends about Conrack, a picture which I really loved, and they felt I was doing a film about a white Jesus. And uh, they, they were into, politically and historically at that point, black studies and such. And I've been into integration for 50 of my 70 years. And I, I, said, I said to them, make your own picture. Get off my back. This is what I believe in. And I'm not violating anything I believe in. If you, if it's violating something you believe in, I can't I can't deal with that. And they did not support the film. Why do you persist in making movies on these subjects? I, I, because I feel deeply about their dilemma. Mm -hmm. I always have. You know, I have found, singularly enough, that I'm very related to rural America. Why I don't know. I have. Certainly, I was a big city boy. I grew up in New York City. I wasn't out of the city until I was 40 years old. And why I do have a feeling for rural America, I'm not sure. But I've learned to accept things about myself that I don't totally understand. And uh, particularly, if they're good. And uh, I feel I do have a feeling for rural America. So I'm not listening. In, I'm not putting any boundaries. I would just like to make a serious film about the contemporary black experience, be it in Mississippi, Detroit, or any place. Uh, when we talked the other day, I suggested that uh, one of your other great themes was, was labor, and you said yes. Am I overlooking something that you think is prominent in your concerns? No, I think those are, you know, I did, uh, I did one picture of, uh, you know, about where Paul Newman played an Indian, an hombre, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, again, a disenfranchised group, God knows. If I could find a picture on that subject that was first class, I would jump at the chance to do that. Mm -hmm. Because that's, I mean, they don't have the strength that the Negro population has. Yeah. The Negro population, by virtue of the extraordinary gifts in show business and athletics, you know, have uh, dominated a lot of our culture in the last decade or so. But the Indian, 
has really been neglected. The American Indian is a uh, terrible tragedy. So it's another subject that you would like to talk about? I would in a minute. Today, Marty, we have like widespread unemployment, we have racism, we have threatening global war at any given point. We have all these problems that are really, you know, it's certainly the same, possibly the worse, as bad as, uh, uh, or worse than what, what you faced and thought about in the 30s. Why don't we have socially conscious artists today? Why don't we have socially conscious filmmakers? It's very hard to understand the kind of historical time that we're in. It is obviously a very conservative time, and not only here, all over the world. Uh, I must say for the everlasting credit of this country that nobody has been shut up. That I, people like me, have been allowed to speak, whereas in some other countries, I can well imagine, if I had the kind of differences I have with uh, the establishment, I might well be in jail. And the, that kind of, in, in, of intrinsic strength that exists in our way of life is not in any way to be looked down at. It's terrific. It really is terrific. It makes it possible for good work to continue. Why the climate has changed, it's hard for me to say. I'm not, I'm not that much of a political seer. Uh, I think it will change again. I think the pendulum will swing another way, finally. But it is tough today. It is very tough today. You're saying tough to be a liberal. It is tough to be a liberal and try to work and make films about what you believe. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, starting with the old uh, corny remark that is ascribed to Warners, if you want to, you know, if you, if you, you got a message to send it, to, send it by Western Union. You know, people shy away, and those pictures have not been doing the greatest of business. Uh, there are a few films that I've made, even the present film, which is really a love story, uh, and it happens to be about a man who is a kind of an idiosyncratic liberal and a, a lady that he meets. Just in dealing with the human elements in the film, the film becomes, in my mind, a liberal film. Uh, I have maybe a greater uh, feeling about the broadness of what, me, what a liberal means. It certainly doesn't mean anything, something that is direct politically, certainly not for, for, a, for a creative person, not for an artist. I'm not interested in uh, polemics, really. I'm not interested in, uh, uh, in making films that I feel are cardboard, uh, statements about what I want to say. I don't think anybody's that much interested in what I want to say, only if I couch it in human terms mm -hmm. and make it attractive and entertaining. Mm -hmm. For the most part, you don't see, uh, you don't see humanity shining forth in, in pictures. You see contrived stories, convention, I don't want to say for the most part, but you know, it seems like it is for the most part. You see convention, conventional stuff, genre stuff, cliches, recycled formulas, I mean, I think the fast food uh, simile is, uh, works. The company is beginning to get pre-digested food, prefabricated houses. Uh, the networks believe that action adventure is the best way to go to get an audience. The studios partially believe that. Horror films and teenage film, they are looking to make a size 12 dress that the country will buy. And the only, the only criterion they have is what was last year's hit. Never realizing, or insufficiently realizing, that a really good film is the individual impulse of some creative person. And uh, the whole the psyche of the, of, of the world is turned on to fast food and teenage and uh, excitement and uh, instant gratification. If a, I mean, if, if you sit down and take the time to see uh, uh, a film made by uh, the Indian director, Satyavid Ray, I don't think most of the audiences in the world have the patience. So it takes an extraordinary artist um, in, in India, somebody like Satyajit Ray and, and uh, this country, God knows who, to uh, 
uh, resist being dehumanized. I think it does. I think, however, with the, with the good ones, they will finally find their way back to this because there's nothing else. I mean, uh, there, there fundamentally is nothing else. That's why in the case of Altman, uh, he is always dealing on, on some level with the human condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, which, which makes him an artist more than someone who's dealing with the cops and robbers. That's right. Genre. You know, he, uh, it's the more difficult kind of film to make, which is another reason the studios shy away from it. The other thing is much more predictable. Yeah. And also, there's more room for failure if you're dealing with a human condition. The films have to be better. And it's, it's very tough, too, because you have to fit the film into a mold which the commercial audience is prepared to accept. Even if it's first class sometimes, and it's not in that mold, they're not going to quite accept it. And the film will not make the kind of money it should. And that will scare the studios. Yeah. Is, um, you said to me uh, in, when we talked before that ultimately, uh, in, in times of either political strife or um, conflict, that you trust the artists rather than the politicians, that the artists would lead you to the truth. More, more so than anybody else I know. I believe that. I believe that deeply, and it sustained me. In times w which looked very black for me, I felt that I, I had to go on because uh, it had to be what, whatever I wanted to say, I felt had to be said. You know, and, and as I say, I, I am considered by many a, a very political fellow. My films are, are hardly outside of two, maybe three. Maybe Norma Ray would be included in that, uh, are hardly political. Is there a relationship between a, a good movie, not a good movie of yours, but a good movie in general, and telling the truth? I think so. A good one, not a successful one. I differentiate between the two, obviously. Yes, if it's, if it's really good, it has to be, it has to have true perception about with what it, with what it deals. What if it's a fantasy, comic book, conceptual? Well, those are, there are also very true perceptions in those. It is naive to assume that any film, even the is not political. They're all social, at least. They're either selling escape or they're selling reality. Now, uh, so even the, the Disney films, which were considered totally without message, that's childish. They were certainly not without message. They were selling a different parcel of food to the American public and the world public, which the world and American public were prepared to buy. Well, according to that line of thinking, then there's there are good MTV videos as well as bad ones. In the, in the sense I guess there, there are the, the the really the really really good ones. Yes, well, there'll be some perception in it that makes the whole MTV worthwhile. Yeah, even if it's only an extraordinary visual perception. And an ex and something visually that's extraordinary can be truthful, just as a, a message can be truthful. That's right, yeah. because it is a perception of the creative person, you know, and that's where his talents lie, that's where his inclinations lie. It is very rare. And it's not compromised by the marketplace, is that what you're saying? It's, well, because it doesn't have to be. He's lucky. It's in a form that the marketplace is excited about. It's almost as if we're hamstrung by the word truthful. It's, it's kind of rabbinical, yeah. you know, and uh, I don't want to sound that way, and I don't I don't believe that. I, 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 I like very few. I don't remember one that I really like, MTV. But I see things in the MTV which I find very interesting and very attractive from a, from a point of view of form. Yeah. Um, how do you ca categorize yourself politically relative to Hollywood in general? Well, I would certainly think I'm in the, in the left of, uh, of, of the Hollywood uh, contingent. Definitely, and and also openly, and admittedly, mm -hmm. I'm not careful. Uh -huh. I've, I've not I've not made a career of being careful. Do you find that uh, taints you at all in terms of when you try and get a project going, uh, in your next project? I don't even think about it because I don't give a shit. Yeah, how do you categorize Hollywood politically as compared to the rest of the country? I think Hollywood is probably more liberal than the rest of the country at this point in time, but. Uh, but not so it'll hurt business. Uh, You've heard the great, I, I got to tell you this great story about the guy who walked into the bank. Have you heard this, Joe? No. And he said he walked up to the girl behind the counter and he said, I want to make a fucking deposit. 
And the guy said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, sir. He said, what do you mean, wait a minute? I want to make a fucking deposit. So she said, this is a bank, sir. You just can't talk that way. He said, I'll talk any fucking way I want. I want to make a fucking deposit. She said, well, I'm going to have to call the manager. He said, I don't give a shit who you call. Call him. She calls over the manager, and the manager says, what's the problem? He said, uh, I want to make a, there's no problem. I want to make a fucking deposit, that's all. The manager says, wait a minute. This is a bank, sir. He said, I don't give a shit what it is. I want to make a fucking deposit. Now, I just hit, I just hit the lottery for $2 million, and I want to make a fucking deposit. And the manager says, and this cunt won't take your money? <laughs> so that's it. I mean, that's capitalism. That's your short essay on capitalism. You, I think you once told me that the crunch shouldn't have been a comedy and wasn't supposed to be. Well, we started to write a more serious film. The film originally was about Hecky. And Walter and I, halfway through, looked at each other one day and said, it's going to be maudlin, it's going to be sentimental. Let's include Hecky. But we, we remember this story about a front, because it really happened. I said, let's, well, I don't know whether it was me or Walter, but together we came up with the notion that uh, that's what the film should be, and that's what it became. But I think when you told me once, you were pretty vehement about it shouldn't have been a comedy. Not, well, that, not that you... Reg I, no, I would like to make another picture on that subject that deals more seriously with that time and that subject. I think it, it might have a chance to be a better film. And why would it have to be more serious? Do you feel that... Um, I, think the, I think the front was... A lot of I, people didn't believe the front. Yeah, I, I think it was digestible, even for my parents. Yes, know? but still, a lot of people didn't believe it. When I showed that film in several colleges, the kids said to me, what are you talking about? They didn't believe it. So do you think that um, a proper film on the subject ought to take a bite out of you? Yes. Um, I think we talked about this the other day, that the blacklist was basically, you know, apart from the human toll, which was so terrible, that it was a, it was a way of imposing censorship. Yes, it was. Uh, but I mean, I think since the front, we're not, we've now, the pendulum has now swung back so that we look upon uh, the blacklist kind of, um, uh, you know, almost congenially and think that these people are, are you know, at, at worst they became celebrities, you know, through their experience. Um, and we have a president of the United States who in, helped impose the blacklist who goes on, you know, who says, well, there really wasn't any blacklist and just a few people didn't work, etc. Well, it's my opinion that he's dead wrong. And, you know, I was called when that item broke. I was down at Del Mar and I said, no, I'm going to the race today. And they have to, we have a crew here because they were dealing with the with the alien thing, mm -hmm. the guys who were coming up and working on the track. And I they interviewed me, and I said, I'm shocked to hear that he was an informant. You know, he was then the head of a union, I think. Mm -hmm. And the next day, Meese came out with a statement that any red-blooded American would do the same thing. But the interview never ran. See, I guess the CB... And the whole thing was quashed in one day you read that the president had been an informant, then two days later it was no longer in the papers. Uh, I think, I know in two cases, two of my friends were deeply cut up and, and died early in life because of the un in injustice of the blacklist. Um, it's also part of the mentality that now says we want the Vietnamese war. Yeah. In other words, anything that is that the, the country doesn't come off looking too well for for, for their behavior mm -hmm. is shuffled under the rug. We don't want to know about it. We didn't do it. We didn't do that. That's not true. That was the feeling of the American people. As you say, that's what the president said. The, the uh, establishment will never admit to it because they would be liable to the biggest. CBS to this day does not admit that it was a blacklist at CBS. No, I know why I was fired. Uh, they will not admit because they have no legal position. They could very well be sued. Uh, there was a blacklist, unquestionably. It was unfair, it was unjust, and it didn't make the people who were blacklisted any better than they had been before, artistically. Some of them were pretty good, some of them were not so good, some of them were bad, some of them were very good. And that more or less remained but the injustice was still a terrible one. And a lot of people who might have been... And a lot of people who might have developed and gotten to be better never had that chance. 
and the few of us who survived it are the really among the most fortunate people in the, in the country. I think I should say that I think the country owes an everlasting debt to the people who stood up and were prepared to be counted at that point. Because without that body of people and without that body of thought, perhaps McCarthy would have been able to go a lot further than he did. And perhaps any fascist or neo-fascist would be able to do a lot more than they were able to do. I don't think philosophically the country quite understands, nor do many writers and critics understand, the significant thing that happened when that small body of professors, musicians, actors, directors, writers stood up to be counted. And a lot of doctors are, and teachers, people, all kinds of professionals, who knew that a grave injustice was being done. And it was a very significant point in American history to me. And I've never, I was honored by the, the Jean Renoir at my 70th birthday, and I had a few of my friends there, and I turned to the audience and thanked them. And I said, I know full well that if you people had not acted as you did at that time, I would have had no chance to have any kind of a career. Yeah. Okay. And I believe that. And nobody has really ever written about that or mentioned that. Is there still bitterness? I never quite had that kind of, my wife to this day will not speak to certain kinds of people. Uh, I know several people like that, who if they would see certain people in the street would spit in their face. Uh, I don't know a single person who behaved in my life properly, who has been any less of a human being in the rest of his life. And I know a lot of guys who behave what I think is badly who have, have not really re realized themselves as artists or human beings since that time. That's interesting. How do you account for that? You think it was such a... They made a wrong move. Yeah. They violated themselves. Has there been uh, any... I think in the 50s, late 50s, when you started directing, I, it seems to me that there was, a, at that point, a real tangible effect on our culture that, you know, movies were bland. Right. They were repressed. The 50s were probably the worst decade in the country, in the century. Is there a permanent effect? Is there a lingering effect in terms of the effect on our culture? Or, would, or did the 60s bring it all back? I think the 60s brought it back. You know, I think the 80s are in the same area as the 50s. And I, probably the 90s will bring it back. I mean, the strength of the country is incalculable. Mm -hmm. It survives everything. Mm -hmm. Is, is it possible that it could happen again? Sure, it's possible, but it's less likely because there was that core of people who did the right thing at that time. So we'll always have their example. And it has nothing to do with politics. That has to be understood. It has nothing to do with, it has to do with morality. I have never in my life confused ethics and politics. I know some very ethical people with whom I have no agreement at all politically, and I know some very unethical people that I have all kinds of agreement with politically. You can't deny who you are or what you are. If suddenly you know, our two greatest playwrights in my time were Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller, and if suddenly they find they, they're not popular because everything has swung the other way, certainly was in the case of Tennessee. you got to have enough class to pick up their marbles and say, that's who I am, that's what I am, and that's what I'm going to do. And if you don't like it, fuck you. It's no less work because you don't happen to like it because it doesn't suit the time. Tennessee ended tragically, unfortunately. He was a great artist, unquestionably. And it had an incredible effect on our society. He wrote about the most unlikely things in the world and made them part of American everyday talk. Big Daddy, you know, who, I mean, flowery, not flowery, poetic terms, you know, which uh, was special to him. 
and were foreign to the rest of the country because they were told, told with such truth and such, such riveting poetic gift that it became everyday, everyday lore with the American people. What are the limitations for progressive artists working in Hollywood? The limitations are the studios fundamentally don't want to make serious films. They just don't want to. They come to the conclusion that they're not as good an investment as the other kinds of films. That will pass, too, as the other kinds of films begin to go by the wayside, as they have in the last year or so. The horror films and the teenage, the teenage-oriented films have begun to go by the wayside. And consequently, uh, it's, I think, maybe a little easier uh, to get a serious film on. But it never has been easy to get a serious film on. Never. But, but in the days of the studios, they would, they, as a matter of pride, they would want to put out, you know, five serious movies mm -hmm. a year for award purposes, for their own aggrandizement. And for the, for the PR value. For the PR value. And I think legitimately because they believed in serious movies to a certain extent. I somebody, think they did. Somebody like Daryl Zanuck, he wanted to put out these terrible musicals, but at the same time he wanted to put out an important picture. You know, just think back. The last five pictures that were nominated last year were all turned down by major studios. Every single one of them. That's got to tell you something about what major studios are prepared to uh, subsidize at this point. Any guy who's going to give them a picture that can't be channeled or, or they can't uh, put into some kind of mold, they're nervous about it. And they're nervous because business has fallen off. There were some mistakes made about the immediacy of the cassettes. And, uh, and the cassettes are beginning to bury motion pictures mm -hmm. in terms of economics. So uh, it's, it's really even hard to criticize the studios because they're really in, they're, this is a business to them. Yeah, they the would market. like to make good pictures, but uh, fundamentally, if they, there's no good picture to an exhibitor that doesn't make money. Mm -hmm. that, by definition, that's a good picture, a film that makes money. We know, of course, that's not true, and we've seen a lot of schlock in the last few years make bundles of money. Mm -hmm. Are there limitations on you artistically being in Hollywood? In other words, uh, you know, there, for example, there's this independent film movement of people who say, you know, you should make small movies in Florida or something. Uh, um, if I could find a small movie to make in Florida, I'd make it in a minute. The films I've wanted to make, I never charge the kind of money that I do for the other kinds of films. Yeah. What are the limitations for you politically in Hollywood? Is the sky the limit if you can figure out how if to If I find it? a picture that I want to make that happens to be too political for this game, I'll find another way to make it. You know, and I may be able to sell them even a political picture by bringing the picture in at such a price that they can't resist it. Because I'll get stars, and I'll make the film. Is part of the problem in Hollywood uh, um, just finding the material in this kind of society where it's a liberal, tolerant society, and no one is no one is breaking through the barriers to? No, it's very tough to find that kind of material. Most of it exists in the past, and. Uh, but I, I haven't found anything on that level that I really would prepare to go to bat for mm -hmm. and say, I'll make this picture. I'll make it for four and a half million dollars. I don't want any money in front. Now, this will probably bring me a rash of scripts of the worst goddamn scripts that anybody could read. Because I get some of those. I get some crazy uh, scripts, political scripts, that are just god awful. Because they, it's all politics, and they've forgotten everything else. Well, what's the problem with political screenwriters? They can't lick. Uh, I don't think there are a lot of them around. They were developed in the same time that I was developed. Yeah. You know. Well, do you think they all nowadays people just think in terms of, you know, like cardboard agitprop, and they can't figure out. How More or less, they think in, in either in terms of straight entertainment. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a problem for, for leftist filmmakers all over the world. It's not. It's not really their time. They've got to find some way to keep alive during this time until the time comes back. And it will come back because it always has. In terms of Hollywood, are there great leftist movies or are there great progressive movies that you would point to as being among your favorite, both as movies and as politics? 
Let's say you were having a Marty Ritt weekend at UCLA and you were forced to show five movies. That I, I know were, what I would show. I yeah. would show Battle of Algiers first. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and I, I, maybe second and third. You know, <laughs> because I love that film. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. How about if I had told you you had to put a few Hollywood movies on the list? I wouldn't, it would be, wouldn't be faring too well. <laughs> How about, uh, you told me the other day about Grapes of Wrath and John Ford. Do you think that's a qualified, uh... I think that's a, a, a great film, a great liberal film, and I love the film. And I love the director. I think the director is maybe the best director we've turned out. Yeah, you explained to me the other day that there's an example of a, of a basically conservative artist, art, conservative not meaning politically conservative, but just a conservative man, traditional man, who when he was forced to go deeper into himself to produce his work, he produced, you know, fundamentally humanist, liberal, progressive Because work. he's a great artist. And a great artist will fun fundamentally always tell the, as, as much of the truth as he can. And it is my deep feeling, because of my orientation toward life, that the greatest truth is in the liberal tradition. Yeah. Um, it, see, first and foremost, it has to be entertaining. Mm -hmm. Because if it isn't entertaining, you're not going to affect anybody. Mm -hmm. If you can't get through to people, mm -hmm. you're not going to affect anybody. Mm -hmm. So that's the first and foremost. The intellectual thing would sometimes inhibit that. Any film that is fundamentally cerebral and is playing to a very small segment uh, of the society, some part of it is immediately in inhibited. I feel that I'm plain enough, mm -hmm. that what I really like Will be I will be able to get to the, most of the people because I'm I feel I'm more or less like most of the people, mm -hmm. maybe a little more sophisticated, a little fatter, uh, a little smarter, uh, to according to some of my critics a little more gullible. Uh, but I'm I figure I'm pretty close to a lot of American Joes. Um. Would it have been different for you? Um, would the possibilities, would your imagination have been differently, different if you had worked like Joe Losey did and completely outside of Hollywood? I might have. I don't think that I quite had Joe Losey's skill and that I would not be able to do subject matter that was not part of my gut. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I didn't know Joe well enough, but I admired many of his films. And I felt that uh, I didn't know Joe well enough to know if that was his gut. I just couldn't say that. Yeah. But I think with a guy like me, I better do films that are out of my gut. Um, do you feel at all uh, inhibited by the fact that you don't write? Somewhat. But every director writes, you know, whether he really writes the written word. I've, I've written two plays in my lifetime and I've tried to write two or three screenplays. And they're all serviceable. They're never really good. And so, you know, I know that I shouldn't be, I mean, when I've done six films with the Ravages, I know how good they are. I know the kind of talk they write. And I can, I can never compete. I manage that kind of talk sometimes in conversation, but never when faced with the empty page. Again, the fundamental thing is I pick up something, I read it, and I'm affected. When I read the article about that woman in the New York Times Magazine section, talking to her two children, out of which you made the film Norm Array, explained to them how tough life was going to be because the town was after her because she was on the side of the Union. I was very affected. I had never, I, I remembered so few times in my life, even with the most sophisticated and conscious political women, to ta taking that point of view. And for this unsophisticated, Mm -hmm. to take on that load because of some recognition that had come into her life affected me a great deal. Was well, it fair to say that after you get the material that you try and bring yourself to a project through the actors, through the acting? Well, I'm, yes, I, would, I think that is fair. And I feel that very often the performances of the, of the films that I make illuminate the subject matter. It's part of that, part of the fact that I was an actor, part of the fact that I was trained as an actor, at the group theater, and that I've taught acting at the Actors Studio, and, and there's several other places. Uh, 
and uh, I have I love actors. I mean, I really love them, and as I see them begin to function, I can be very helpful. What's the value of, uh, of complexity in a performance? It's of extraordinary value, because the mark of an artist finally is the complexity with which, with which he deals with what he deals with. Uh, the uh, facility, which some actors have to a very high degree, is of some importance, but it's, it's not nearly as important as the ability to perceive things which make a character genuinely come to life. How hard do you work with actors? I work very hard. And in what way? Can you describe the process? Well, it's hard to say. I do rehearse for two weeks in which they understand, in which time I make them understand what it is about the picture, why I'm doing it, why I like it. And I will not let an actor, I will listen to an actor change certain words, never if it's going to violate the meaning of the scene. I am explained to them, I am committed to meaning. And I will go along with anything short of changing the meaning that I think the film should have. Content to me is, uh, now it doesn't have to be as it isn't, say, in some of the films I've made. It can be light, as it is in Murphy's Romance, which is really fundamentally a straight love story. But uh, I think it has a lot of humor and a lot of feeling and a lot of uh, understanding of the dilemma of this younger woman and this older man. Yeah. Um, I asked you about this the other day. I was surprised that as a leftist you did Faulkner. And you said you wouldn't do him again. I wouldn't because I don't, I, I don't think... Uh, uh, the Long Hot Summer was a, a good entertaining commercial film. The other one, Silent Fury, I didn't like. I made some mistakes in that. And I don't... Uh, I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't do it. It's too rich. It really is too rich. With a, with great writers like that, it's very tough because in a film you have to tell a story. And when the language becomes so much the star of the story, the story, it's almost not translatable. Yeah. It becomes something else. And it was just accidental that you got drawn into Faulkner at a certain yes. point? really because of the ravages, because they are devoted to him and think, you know, he's the greatest American writer, which he may well be. Yeah. Um, which of your movies are closest to the way you would like, would wanted them to be? The other day you said your three, the three that were Oscar nominated. Well, no, I would include in that Hud, uh, Norma Ray, Son, The Mon Conrad, the front, the spy who came into the door. There are a lot of them that I, I would say about, I've made about 20 some odd films. Two or three of them I really don't like. Mm -hmm. But most of them you do? Most of them I like in varying degrees. How come so many of the, the uh, great directors of your generation aren't working? Or is, it, is it just, uh, is it more than just um, Oh, attrition? Well, part of it's attrition. Uh, the rest of it, I, I don't... The kind of pictures that are being made, they don't... They never were... They never made. And maybe... Uh, I think they could make them if they wanted to. There's no reason why they couldn't. I don't really know. You know, I feel fortunate that I'm able to work. Yeah. Well, Marty, this is great.